quarter to even. Okay, the recording equipment's working, the camera's fine. I will sit down in a minute, but um, I'd like to, I'm just reminding myself a few things I ought to say this morning. There are some people that are going to be with us today who were not here um, yesterday, but it's also good to remind ourselves of uh, um, what happened yesterday and how that fits in with the whole three days, because what I've tried to do for you is create, if you like, a three-course meal. And... Um, some of the great questions towards the end yesterday were, I wanted to stand up and say, hey, you're asking about the dessert. Well, we're, only on the, we're only on the starter at the moment. Uh, I, I hope you've noticed that in the, in the program. Uh, I'll, come, I'll come back to this in, in a minute. Um, let me say before I go any further how great it was having Jack Buckskin doing the welcome to country at the beginning yesterday. Didn't he do a good job? And I'll probably get the wording wrong doing this because my, as I said, my brain is off somewhere else. But of course, each day of this conference, we uh, recognise that we're meeting on the lands of the Ghana people. Uh, and of course, there are lands that were never ceded and that we stole from them, uh, basically. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. And just going back to one of the things I said at the beginning yesterday, if you're going to steal somebody's land, the least you can do is look after it, um, which we're not doing a great job of at the moment. And that's another reason for referring back to the book, which we only touched on, or Tyson and Kelly only touched on a little bit yesterday. You need to read the whole book, Sand Talk, for a, 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 a wide-ranging philosophical discussion of what we can learn, not only from Australia's First Nations people, but from indigenous peoples around the world about community and sustainability. And when we talk about community, we're not just talking about geographically at a point in time, but we're talking about over time and a collection, connection with the land over time, stretching back into the past, but also stretching into the future too. And of course, the problem that we have at the moment is that future Australians don't have a vote. But if we can encourage our friends and our ge geographical community at the moment to, to, to think more along these lines, then maybe, in a sense, uh, future Australians will have a vote. Uh, um, that's important, of course, when we're thinking about sustainability. That was a great book. Um, not to spend too much longer, but we are going on a journey... And let me remind you again and sort of pre-warn you a bit. Um, I've tried to mix things up. So we're going to have a nice chat uh, in, a, in a minute with two great authors and there are two further books that I strongly encourage you to, to get hold of. Um, and we've got all sorts of things happening today. So we're going to hear from Andres Bernal, who works closely with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. How exciting is it to have him with us? I sound a bit like Scott Morrison, I'm sorry. <laughs> How good is that and all that? Uh, I told you I was tired. And um, we're going to, and I have n literally no idea exactly what he's going to unveil. We're going to hear Bill Mitchell talking about his uh, coalition for a just transitions framework later. That will be interesting. As I said, I don't know. What he's going to say, he hasn't told me. Uh, it is genuinely new information for everybody. It's sort of a premiere that we've got. And of course, and here's a little bit, of, uh, as I was saying, we're talking, we just have the starter yesterday. When we think about the importance of things like household production and also voluntary work, things that are not paid for at the moment in our society and whether they're undervalued generally. Well, yeah, they are undervalued. In fact, they're some of those things not valued at all in gross domestic products. So we're going to be um, looking, or Philip Lawn at the end today is going to be looking at a, a, a way of, you could say, reforming GDP or replacing 
GDP and looking at another measure which doesn't ignore those things, which, if it had more prominence, would fundamentally change public policy in those areas. Because what we value at the moment is very often, to quote Herman Daly, it's, if it's not ilth, as he said, it's, uh, it's doing something to protect ourselves from all that ilth, rather than actually engaging in activities to improve people's well-being um, over time. So yesterday, we heard from Herman Daly, albeit uh, via a video, so you might have noticed him talking about the three precepts of sustainability. We are going to come back to those, not generating waste at a rate which is above the capacity of the natural environment to uh, safely absorb that waste, uh, not using up your renewable resources more quickly than they can be renewed, not chopping down the forest more quickly than it can regrow, uh, and not using up your non-renewable resources at a rate which is quicker than you can develop renewable alternatives for them. We heard from modern monetary theory economists too, who explained to us, both of them, Bill Mitchell, and then later on in conversation, Stephanie Kelton, um, that for a, a government operating in a monetary system like ours, it is literally the case that the government cannot run out of its own currency. If the government chooses to borrow, it's doing that for reasons to do with financial markets. It's not doing that because it needs to borrow. What's more, government deficits are non-government surpluses, so the government's deficit is your surplus. The government surplus, if, if, if the Scotty from marketing manages to, to deliver one, is your deficit. They're taking more away from you in tax than they're giving you in government spending. Now, why would you want that if it wasn't necessary? They're going around boasting that that would be a great thing. Why? Once you understand the distinction between a currency issuer and a currency user, which is the most important single thing in economics that ordinary people don't, ordinary people, that most people, most economists actually, don't properly understand, then it completely changes your perspective about everything, and you can focus on those things that matter. What matters? Well, amongst other things, those sustainability precepts that Herman Daly was talking about. Um, I won't go on because I've got uh, two very interesting people to talk to now, apart from just to mention some of the organisations which have helped to promote this conference. I won't say which have supported this conference because we deliberately which is why we're grateful for any contributions you make, and thanks for buying all my books, that helped um, a lot. Uh, some of the organisations which have helped us promote the conference, we have not taken money from any of them, uh, or the university. We are completely independent in that respect, but we are grateful to the New Economic Network Australia. This, I'm just listing them, I'm not, li this doesn't, I'm not talking about which is given more help and which less or anything, no judgment like that. Rethinking Economics, Economic Reform Australia, Sustainable Population Australia, which should not be confused with the political party, Sustainable Population, which is something completely different. Uh, the Labour uh, Economic Action Network from the Labour Party and the Australian Greens, various branches, and the trade union movement. And I would especially like to thank uh, a, a union which we're going to have a national coordinator from talking to us later, the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, for their support of this conference. The Anti-Poverty Network, the Adelaide University Economics Club, which is a group of students that some of you here uh, are members of, which is great. Um, and Get Up as well, who amongst other things hire Gabby, and we know how important Gabby has been to this conference, all being, she, we, I, I should say, so she doesn't get in trouble with Get Up. She's been doing all this work in her spare time, but I'm very grateful. Um, I'm very grateful to her and to um, volunteers here like Paul, who are members of, uh, of Get Up. I'm also grateful to the School of Economics, um, who have allowed us to use this facility, and it's pretty good, isn't it? It's a nice building. We've not had to pay any money to use it, and if I could particularly thank, maybe you could join me in thanking very quickly, we're about to get on with things, uh, uh, Coco Hoskin-Murray, 
and Ella Purse who are helping me out with the recordings here at the front. Actually, you can see the back of their heads, so they're in the recording uh, while, we, while, we, while we talk about this. All right. Now, uh, I've got two very interesting authors. Well, they're not just authors here um, with me. Jeff Davis and Cameron Murray. I had bios for both of them written down, but given uh, how well organised I am this morning, I don't have those bios with me, so let me just tell you a little bit about both of them. Jeff is a serious scientist. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, I've got Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, Economics degrees, but I mean a proper uh, scientist. Jeff uh, is an internationally renowned geoscientist who, since his retirement, has written a variety of books on economics, the most recent of which, which you, I, I strongly recommend, like I did say and talk yesterday, is called Economics, Society, Nature, an Introduction to the New Systems-Based Life-Friendly Economics. It's a, it's a great and very wide-ranging book. Uh, Jeff has written a series of other books on economics since his retirement as well. Uh, uh, was it Seriously Seeking the Fair Go? Was that one of them? <laughs> Desperately seeking the fair go. I'm terribly sorry. There's one that sticks in my mind. Don't tell my boss I said this. Uh, sack the economists and close down their departments. That was another of Jeff's books. Um, there's the little green book of economics. I think... What's the long title, Jeff? <coughs> well, I can read it. Can the little green, I'm afraid of economics, but I want to save the world book. That's another one. <laughs> Of, of Jeff. Um, so Jeff is one of my, the two authors I have uh, with me. Uh, he was, as I mentioned, at uh, ANU and is still associated with uh, ANU. So look him up. Um, he, he's had all sorts of awards for uh, his work in geoscience. Many, many publications, as I said, a serious scientist. And we're going to ask, what's a scientist's perspective? on the orthodox economics which has been dominating our public policy over the last 35 years, at least. And my other guest is Cameron Murray, who, while he was at the University of Queensland with his colleague Paul Freiters, wrote a book. Well, he's done many other things as well. You can read his bio on our publication. He runs a very popular uh, blog site that you might like to follow. But the book that he is particularly known for is called Game of Mates, How Favours Bleed the Nation, and I'll let him explain something about that book in a moment. I have changed, I don't know whether he'll agree with me or sanction this, but I no longer use the word neoliberalism very much. I now just talk to people about the big game of mates, the way in which wealth is sucked from the bottom to the top and in which public policy is distorted in Australia. It's not just about sucking wealth from the bottom to the top, it's also about <coughs> ensuring that we do lots of bad things or things that are not optimal and that many of the kinds of investments that we ought to be making are not made as a result of the way in which Australia, but not just Australia, many economies in the world has increasingly become organised as the decades have gone Bye. So please welcome my two guests. Welcome. <laughs> I might start with a question for Jeff. Um, what's a scientist's view of mainstream economics as a science? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and I'm not allowed to use very rude words. Well, bear um, in mind I work at this university yeah, so and this, this is recorded. Be yeah. as polite as I can. Well, as a, <coughs> as a real scientist, my understanding is that a theory... Uh, sorry, can you hear me up the back? Yeah, good. A theory is a story that provides useful guidance as to how the world works. Now, you'll notice I said nothing about truth or anything. Useful is a criterion. Um, I read about 
the mainstream theory, the neoclassical theory of markets, Brian Toohey's book in the 90s, and it became very clear that this theory is quite irrelevant to any real economy. Um, it's a theory that the economy is like a rocking horse, but if I look at and and if you push it, it comes, it rocks a little and comes back to an equilibrium, and it's all about equilibrium. If I look at an economy, I see instabilities everywhere. Um, a bubble and crash is an obvious example, but the steady concentration of wealth and ownership and very, you know, it's easy to see instability. Then I read a book called Complexity about self-organizing systems um, and it just seemed very clear that this is a far more productive theory for understanding economies. Um, so the implication of that, continuing my metaphor, is that an economy, a series of markets, is more like a mob of wild horses, a mob of brumbies, um, who are, th they, they may run straight for a while or they may graze quietly for a while, but they're prone to sudden changes and bolting off and whatever. Uh, and that's a much more appropriate description of a real economy. So we're not dismissing economics as a, as a it, and uh, in my book, which uh, some of you uh, have got copies of now, I uh, refer to somebody talking about economics as brain damage. <laughs> I said you may as well say any discipline is brain damage. It can be done appropriately or it can be done <coughs> inappropriately. You can employ the, employ the scientific method <coughs> or, or not. How should we go about thinking about the well, economy? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, there's several contentious points in if I say I think there can be a science of economies. Um, for one thing, economies involve people and a lot of people don't like the idea of science applying to people but that's because I think um, they have in mind the old reductionist Newton type science which works brilliantly for non-living things but is rubbish for living things because a living thing, if you reduce it to its parts, it's dead. Um, if you want to study a living thing, you've got to study the whole. Um, and you can, and that's the marvelous thing about this relatively new field of system science and self-organizing systems is that you can recognize that uh, living systems are complex self-organizing systems. You have to study them as a whole. You can study them as a whole. And economies you can study as a whole and you can look inside but, but not rip apart and pretend that by looking at this bit um, you're going to understand exactly how it works because it only works in a context of the larger whole. Um, <coughs> My experience in studying the Earth, actually, I studied the deep interior, which you can't see. You use indirect and incomplete information. Um, <clears throat> it taught me that what we're doing is, as I said, coming up with stories that makes, hopefully make some sense of what we can see. Now, I can look at an economy and see some patterns. You can see a bubble of debt followed by a crash. Well, population, um, people who study population dynamics have a simple model of that sort of thing, which you can easily adapt uh, and give a description of a boom and crash. Um, and <coughs> even, a, well, I've got it in, in the book that Steve waved around <laughs> earlier. Um, even such a very simple thing is better than the mainstream theory which says the best they've done as far as I'm aware is oh here's the economy in, in balance before the crash and here it is after the crash um, 
and how has it changed, but that misses the essence of the crash because there would have been no crash if the economy was in balance. The essence of the crash is being out of balance, out of equilibrium. So you can think about things like this. Steve Keane, the economist who used to be at University of Western Sydney, is now in Europe, um, has done rather more sophisticated um, models using money and debt and so on. Um, and I think these are extremely productive ways to come at an economy. And if you do that and if you're careful <coughs> to use things that can be observed and to compare with what's observed, then you are doing a science of economies. And uh, one of the things you might imagine is that economists habitually do that already, um, which at least if you're thinking about mainstream macroeconomics, I might risk saying is not the way genu genuinely in which, it, in which it's done. One other thing I might ask you before we, we move on to yeah. Cameron. Um, this is not true <coughs> of all branches of economics, and in fact in Jeff's book uh, there are a variety of what are sometimes called heterodox approaches to economics which should be part of a new economics. One of them is behavioural economics, there's something there's feminist economics, there's institutional economics that, uh, that, uh, that Jeff uh, mentions, post-Keynesian economics. Uh, Jeff Harcourt, the leading Australian post-Keynesian, has just <laughs> come into the room uh, now. But uh, one of the things that you uh, stress, Jeff, is that uh, at least in mainstream macroeconomics, uh, um, um, individuals are treated as though they are hyper-intelligent, calculating machines who are always or almost always selfish and unaffected by and uninfluenced by other people. <coughs> Is it fair to say that? That's my understanding. Um, uh, some people talk about rational economic man or homo e economicus. Is that it? Uh, my term is calculating reptiles. <laughs> <laughs> no social interactions. Now, the thing about looking at an economy as a complex system, uh, a self-organising system, the behaviour of a self-organising system is strongly conditioned by the signalling within, among the components within the system. I think we can identify two major kinds of signalling within our economies. <coughs> One is money which mainstream economists recognise but don't, then don't use, really. Uh, the other is social interaction. Uh, both are excluded from the mainstream theory of markets. So, uh, as I've laid out this book I, Steve waved, I've tried to systematically like present how you would approach this. Um, <coughs> money and social interaction have to be in there at the beginning because they're the essential signalling mechanisms. And maybe I might finish, but there's a, there's a, a, there's a, a recommendation for this book from a very wise person called Dr Stephen Hale <laughs> on, on, on the back of it. Uh, it says, Jeff Davies has written a comprehensive, accessible and coherent theory and a and set of proposals for a sustainable economy, supporting an equitable society, respecting environmental constraints. He describes the existing economic system with its inequities, instabilities and excesses and offers a prescription for a new and better economic order. This book is a significant contribution to the debate about how our social and economic institutions should be reformed to allow us to provide the social foundations for inclusive and sustainable economic development, identified so memorably in Kate Rowe's donut model. Remember her? While respecting the biophysical limits on economic activity. Well, that's what I said about <laughs> Jeff's book. I won't read the other recommendation on the back, which is from Steve Keane, who Jeff referred to, but it does give me a nice <laughs> intro to the other book, which uh, I'm uh, um, promoting, you might say, this morning, because I think it's an absolutely brilliant book, um, which is the Game of Mates book. Well, let's see what Steve Keane has to say about that. Uh, 
While we are distracted by mythical battles in the Game of Thrones, we are being robbed in the real world, Game of Mates, where the well-connected connected, clip the wages and the profits of the hard-working. Murray and Freiters provide an entertaining, and it really is entertaining, and well-researched expose of how privilege and rent-seeking dominates the Australian economy, enriching the mates in the game while robbing the rest. And they propose how to end the game. And they name real names too. They do. I'm not going to name real names here. I'm Cameron Mike. This is an explosive and essential book for all Australians, except the mates. <laughs> this is a very entertaining book. You have my personal guarantee. If you buy this book and you're on holiday <coughs> and you start reading it in the morning, you'll want to keep reading it all day. It's absolutely fascinating. And if I was to go back to Jeff for a moment, it definitely is applying the scientific method, observing what's out there, looking at the evidence, and coming up with a framework to make sense of the evidence, which is useful when it comes to actually doing something positive to build a better society. So, Cameron, um, what's a game of mates? <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay up the back? Yep. Can you hear? Thumbs up. There's a little light on. The light's on, but nobody's home. That's interesting. What about this? Yeah, we'll try that one, eh? How's that? Better? Uh, <coughs> thanks for that lovely introduction, and thanks to our collective mate, Steve Keen. We do know how this game of mates works. We do look after each other, don't we? <laughs> Um, so the game of mates is just the story of political favouritism and how groups coordinate at this level. So we're not these uh, atomistic individuals, we're social creatures who coordinate in groups and find like-minded uh, individuals to serve their individual and collective interest. And so the game of mates is about um, how this game is played in politics, how much it costs us. So I, uh, we go around different sectors of the Australian economy and say, What's, what's the world's best system here? Why aren't we there at that world's best? Who's benefiting from the situation as it is compared to that? Uh, and how much does that cost us? And so we add that up, and it's hundreds of billions a year uh, just getting creamed off the workers uh, of the country by politically connected individuals. Um, and we propose what to do about it um, based on a, a, a sort of theory that does include a lot of signalling to coordinate at this um, at these levels uh, and, and we sort of caution about what doesn't work uh, and to test some of these proposals for example uh, in Queensland we've uh, now implemented real-time political donations disclosure so at the end of the week you go online and you can see who donated to which political party each week uh, and f somehow that's meant to stop political favors being given to those who donate but if you look at the records of donations, the same donors have donated for the last 25 years. I could tell you now who's going to be on that record in six months' time. How exactly does changing the time at which we confirm this previous knowledge change their behaviour? It's not clear to me that it does anything. It's not clear to me that transparency is a recipe to solve political favouritism. And I know that because I also, you'll read in there, ran uh, a number of experiments in a computer world that I coded and uh, ran with over 400 university students where they got to form their own game of mates in a computer world and trade favours and literally steal money off other people in the game world that were sitting at the other side of the classroom. And they did it and they loved doing it and when they were observed doing it, when they were observed by the outsiders trading favours with their mates, they, become, they became uh, more strongly attached to their mates because they're like, well, if you're willing to favour me while you're being seen by others, it must be that you're more loyal to my relationship and thus our sort of favour trading can continue more robustly because I know you're willing to do it even if everyone can see. So transparency can backfire. So that's the sort of uh, research that uh, got put into this book. I didn't want to uh, finish my PhD on political favouritism and have 12 academics read it uh, in, in the academic journals. I thought this is, might be actually useful if we want to understand how to make a better society. We need to navigate 
these political networks in our favour or in the, the broader network's favour rather than the smaller uh, networks. Thanks very much, Cameron. So basically you're saying that uh, this is not about us saying that all these people that take part in this game are, are, are in a sense evil or any different from the rest of us? No, well that's, uh, that's been the biggest lesson for me is that um, political favours aren't um, typically a backroom deal where people know they're doing the wrong thing and they know that they're stealing from society. Politicians are just human beings with the limited capacity to understand the world and they respond to people they interact with every day and when those people reward them for doing particular behaviours, they think, okay, wow, that must be good for society because my mates keep inviting me to speak at their breakfast and rewarding me and doing all this stuff. So uh, this must be good. And in fact, in this computer experiment, when I surveyed people afterwards, those who found mates and literally stole money, in my, the way I frame it, from others in the room, thought they were doing the right thing. And they felt good and they were happier. Because they said, I felt great, I was helping my mate. I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about those other people. So, so I guess one of the lessons from that and, and since that has been that we can't really um, be in the business of um, blaming a belief system. That's why, as Stephen might have mentioned earlier, I don't use the term neoliberalism or I don't blame particular people's belief system or economic theories on their beha or for their behaviour. The behaviour is driven by our environment and we will just backfill a story that makes our actions internally consistent. And if, if there's that sort of story uh, floating around, I'll go, oh, I, I did it because of that. See, that makes sense. You just pick up an excuse after the fact. And I think that's really important. Um, and in the context of this conference, I wanted to mention, you know, a lot of the business of MMT, from what I can tell, is persuading people to change their beliefs about the budget or how government budgeting works and money works. Mm. I don't see it as necessary to actually change that belief to get political change because I've not observed any politician who actually believes this or is motivated by a consistent belief. I've met with many treasurers and premiers and federal politicians and proposed to them, here's a great way you can repair your budget by stopping giving away favours for free or selling things for zero when you could charge for them. And they tell me, oh, well, yeah, I kind of like it the way it is because my mates are getting free stuff. I don't actually care about the budget, didn't you know? Hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. So why did you say that? Oh, well, you know, we didn't want to do that. That's why I started caring about the budget. But I want to do this. That's why I don't care about the budget. So you can see that these beliefs are sort of backfilled after the fact. Um, I mean, Donald Trump doesn't care about the budget, even though he probably spent 30 years whinging about Democrats for some decisions he didn't like <laughs> in the press, saying, oh, the budget this, the budget that. When it came time for his tax breaks, oh, no, it's, it's, it's economic stimulus when it's something I like. So, you know, in the context of what I do now at the University of Sydney, I do a lot of housing research, and I feel like a lot of researchers in sort of social sectors that rely on government funding to provide community benefits have sort of personally tied their hands to this belief and said, oh, we, we can do more with less. Give us less money and we can stretch it further. I'm saying, they don't care about the money, don't you know? Ask for more. Don't ask for 10 million. Ask for 100 million. Because then it goes from, oh, it's going to cost the budget to, oh, it's economic stimulus. I'm doing something for the community. So I think, I think we can change minds and policy um, by even sidestepping the, the money debate. I mean, it's great that a lot of people are interested and it's going to really help, um, but I don't think you have to change people's uh, beliefs, especially not politicians, for them to change their behaviour. I agree we don't need to change politicians' beliefs, but of course what we do have to make clear to everybody out there is um, people have to be aware that these are political decisions. They're not, they're not, uh, there's no economic. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I important. think that's the awareness that you get yeah. that, hang on, they're not doing this because of the budget. They're, they're doing it because they want to. Because them and their mates are happy with this situation. And they're using the budget as an excuse. And I think 
the more we recognise that, the more we can go, well, let's not argue on their terms. Let's argue on the terms we want. How do we resource this policy that is good for society that we've got this broad agreement on? Absolutely. Maybe it would help to uh, pick on a, a couple of examples uh, that you look at in your book. And, and there's one I wanted to mention, really, because it's the first one, and I think it's where, the, where your research started yeah. from, which is basically rat land rezoning and property speculation and, and the way things are done in the ACT as opposed to the rest of Australia. Could you tell us something about that? Oh, it's, the, it's the great Australian property racket. Uh, it's been going on since James Ruse um, <coughs> first got lot number one on the land register of New South Wales, first ever private piece of land in the country. Uh, for free, of course, because that's what governments in Australia are in the business of giving away free property rights. So uh, my background is uh, working for property developers. So I uh, actually started from looking behind the curtain, <laughs> came out the front. Um, and the big game in property development, obviously, is to buy land where you're allowed to uh, have agricultural uses or industrial uses or low-value uses, pay the previous owner a value that reflects the current use, then ask the politician to grant you on behalf of the community a right to do something of a higher value. Now that additional right is a valuable thing that we could trade. And when we talked yesterday with, uh, was it Herman Daly on the phone yeah. about the cap and trade systems, essentially that's what town planning is, but we can sell that right to develop. We don't have to give it away. So in the ACT, if you have an industrial site and the plan says, oh, you can build a 10-story apartment building, they calculate the value that that right is worth above your current right for the industrial building and they sell it to you at a 25% discount off the market price. So if your piece of land's worth $2 million as an industrial site or $12 million as a site that you can build a 10-story apartment building, you have to pay $7.5 million for that right from the community that we give you, that you didn't pay for because you bought it as an industrial site. And I've scaled up how much the rest of the states could raise if they adopted the same system. And it's around $11 billion per year. Which it's is given away, basically. Which, so $11 billion per year across the states is given away to politically connected landowners by granting them additional rights on behalf of the community for free that they could sell them instead. I also looked, and I can tell you they're politically connected landowners, because also in Queensland I looked at six of the biggest land rezoning decisions. And I looked at the land just on the inside and the outside of those boundaries that were drawn on a map by a statutory authority. And I said, can I predict who got the rezoning based on the characteristics of the land or the characteristics of the land owner? Because that, that site next door or across the road could have had the line drawn around it as well. And it turns out you can predict where that line is drawn by the social network of the landowner. If you're more politically connected, you're on more boards with cross-directorships of other politicians, you employ more lobbyists who are former politicians, you add it all up and you can predict with almost certainty where those lines on a map are going to be drawn and who's going to benefit from that political decision. So. Um, yeah, it's pretty clear to me that this is a huge entrenched rort gamed by networks of insiders who give themselves $11 billion for free from the rest of us and spread stories and myths to cover their tracks after the fact. So they tell us, oh, there's a housing shortage. If you don't give me, rezone me for free, I won't build any houses. If you go and look at the annual reports of these same developers who argue that in their planning applications, when they're obliged to be honest to their investors, they say, we've been granted this new uh, planning approval. This is going to last us 30 years or more. We're going to be slow and flexible to capitalize on market cycles. Well, that's interesting. Which housing affordability are you going to solve? The 2050s one. So they, they, they can basically lie to us and get away with it because they've been lying to enough people uh, in their network that they all believe it's true and they all just pretend that's how the world should be. And when I tell s state treasurers this, they say, oh, we like it that way. 
I literally have a letter from the Queensland uh, Treasurer and Planning Minister saying, yeah, we like rezoning developers' land for free. That's just that's how the system should work. We don't care that we're giving away $2 billion a year to them. We, we want to do that because housing affordability. I'm like, you're just reciting to me the lies that I told you were lies, but thanks very much for the letter. Hmm. Like, um, so that's, that's where I got started. I started digging into a lot of different sectors in superannuation, in, in the public-private partnerships and privatisations, in banking uh, especially. I mean, that's full of myth-making, isn't it? Hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, another <coughs> question. I might. <laughs> I could go on forever. Well... <laughs> Well, we can certainly go on for a few more minutes, and, and there's, there's so much in the book, I almost don't know which chapter to pick on, but I, I, I would like to say, of course, Cameron was describing in the a ACT something which doesn't happen in South Australia, and we know how difficult it is to change things in South Australia because of well-connected interest groups. We remember the land tax reform debate recently, we remember what happened. Do you remember when the state government tried to impose a tiny, tiny tax on, since, we, since you mentioned banking, yeah. our major banks, how that was like World War Three, wasn't it? Yeah. But if I could just ask you yeah. about maybe infrastructure, what would you imagine should be the principles on which infrastructural investment, particularly given that we want uh, ecological sustainability, but we want good infrastructure decisions to be made by our states. How are infra infrastructure decisions actually made? <laughs> well, this was, this was interesting because uh, we had a really uh, crazy bunch of tunnels built in Brisbane, um, very expensive, and then the, uh, the builders went broke, um, but the financiers seemed to walk away with a lot of money. Um, and I thought, what's going on? Who makes these decisions? It doesn't make any sense. And it turns out... Um, We've entrenched this idea of market-led proposals where large construction companies can come and say, hey, government, guess what? I will build this tunnel for you, or this road, or this piece of the network, whether it's rail, road, or whatever. Um, and the government says, because of these myths, and oh, they think it's free and it's not a resourcing problem, they go, oh, that's great, you're going to build something for us, and it's got no budgetary cost, please go and do it. But of course, the road... If you're building a toll road on a network, the toll road that makes you the most money as the toll road owner is usually the worst one for the network as a whole because you want to make the rest of the network more congested relative to your piece, right? So you're going to, in terms of optimizing the whole network, you're going to basically go backwards by proposing things that maximize your individual piece of it. And worse than that, you're going to bamboozle the people on the other side of the debate, to close off alternative routes, which happens all the time, close off alternative routes to, again, funnel traffic into your part of the network. And if you're really smart, you're going to get the government to guarantee you a return if the traffic flows are not as high as you proposed. So essentially you have a publicly guaranteed investment scheme for a bunch of rich financiers for this tunnel or road or whatever it is that makes the whole network less efficient. And it costs us billions per year. It is an absolute joke. What you would want to do optimally is have a bunch of nerd traffic planners and engineers in a room m managing the network and not just the road network but the interaction of all the transport networks and saying, do you know what? This is the best thing, bang for your buck, of how to improve the network as a whole. And you write a list, highest bang for your buck, and you down, and you just start at the top and start doing them. And you don't have to build them, you can contract them out, but that's how you make your decision of which is the best. But what happens is, these sorts of lists exist, then someone says, oh, but I will pay for it. And then this thing off the bottom that's of no use to anyone, that no one even wants, gets brought up and done in front of everything else. So we've got this really sort of set of per perverse incentives happening in the decision making. It's driven by the financial interests of these, these companies that are in the game and it's the sort of their tracks are covered by the myth of there's not enough money. 
to go around, despite the fact that their returns are guaranteed anyway by the public, we could have just built what we thought was optimal for the network. So it's a little bit of a more subtle cost, but uh, when you add it up and you know, across all the major <coughs> cities, it's, it's sort of a disastrous situation. Well, I've just got time for one more question before we uh, open the floor for a, a, a few minutes. Um, maybe I'll sort of combine two things into one. First of all, just because this is kind of uh, interesting, how well connected are the big mining companies? <laughs> and, and secondly, how do we take, how do we end, or at least how do we diminish the significance of these games of mates? Uh, uh, how well one. connected are they? Very. <laughs> like they, they, they write their own laws basically. So when the minerals resources rent tax was proposed, um, certain staff has told me that Parliament House was, uh, there was a traffic jam because there were so many limousines of foreign mining company family members inviting politicians to uh, weddings and holidays <laughs> and essentially entrenching favouritism. Um, she, she said it was out of control. Um, <laughs> but you don't really even need to do that if, if you sort of own the game and your people get selected to run for candidates. Um, I mean, Scott Morrison was a property lobbyist for many years. Well, you know, he's, he's obviously going to be very responsive to that group and that group is going to look after him when he's retired as well. In fact, I propose that losing an election in politics these days is almost as good as winning because then you get your payout from your mates quicker and you get to sit on their boards and get a cushy job. So, so, uh, but I quickly, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about what to do, but it, it relates to the, the comment I heard earlier that we need to replace the politicians. And I think it's a mistake to think, we're back to thinking about individuals when it's really about the structure of the system. Like, no man rules alone, is, is the <coughs> saying. If you've read a book called uh, The Dictator's Handbook, which is a how-to guide, Game of Mates, I, I tell you, is not a how-to guide, even though some people think it is. Um, no man rules alone. So, you know, politicians can't just stand there and go, ha, huh, I've decided this, this is the way it's going to be. They'll get kicked out of their position. Their position's tenuous. It's you know, the power is the power is the structure of the social network um, that, that that keeps it that way. So it, you know, in the in my <coughs> computer game, when I got all these young idealistic left-wing socialist students into a computer environment where the structure was that they could favour their mates and make more money, and they did because I paid over ten thousand dollars to these students for playing the game. So they earned real money, and, uh, and that was dependent on how they played. They, they got seduced, and they thought it was the right thing to do. So I think you know, replacing politicians you know, it can be one approach if those politicians are supported by a network of supporters, but it's not just get one individual in and they can change everything. So what do we do? Well, we need to generate our own networks. Um, I would propose disgruntled family members of former key politicians and political players that have the social network but don't buy into the game, whose careers don't depend on the game, might be one avenue, get them into it, formalise into lobbying organisations and think tanks, just like uh, you know, the Minerals Council and uh, the Property Council have their formal lobbying. Um, Community groups need to do the same thing and they need to get key players and they <coughs> need to know inside information on key politicians. Uh, and you win as a, as a network and as a group. Um, and if you sort of outplay them democratically, you'll get some people in or you can also shift the debate by dominating the, the public discussion. Well, can thank... I, can I pick up Of course, up on go ahead, Jeff. I'd just like to um, spruik my current thoughts relating to this... Um, I think we need to clear out the old parties from Parliament. Um, I hear what you're saying, Cameron, that, um, but they are deeply entrenched, deeply networked. Um, the electorate of Indi in particular has shown us that a community well organised can get somebody into Parliament who will represent them uh, rather than 
represent that. Well, it's a social network, not a money network. Um, and it's the one thing we can do where we don't have to beg powerful people. Um, so, yes, if we put a bunch of independents, uh, more independents into parliament, they would immediately start forming networks and coalitions and whatever, but it wouldn't be so deeply entrenched and so deeply corrupt as the present arrangements. So uh, I think that I, would yeah, help. I, I, I agree it will help, uh, since we're spooking radical things. Um, for example, Queensland doesn't have an upper house of parliament, and I've proposed we have a, a, a sortition arrangement, like jury duty, where you get a letter in the mail randomly drawn and say, congratulations, you're in the Senate. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so we get 100 average representative people, and we stick them in there, and they argue with each other about what laws they like and they don't like, or amendments they like. Um, and we replace them every few years. That, I mean, the problem then is there's going to be a network of advisors and uh, full-time staff that, that um, brief these people that are going to become very powerful. Uh, but I think we can um, come up with sort of uh, systems where, you know, the um, people do their time when they're lawyers. They get professional accreditation for doing time in Parliament helping new senators, things like that. So I think we can entrench... Uh, my, see, the thing I think, like the ACT system where they sell additional property rights, once you've entrenched that and people see it work and see that um, you know, they're, not pay they're not giving things away and it works well, it's very hard to reverse it once it's entrenched. And I think you, know, you could come up with a, um, a people's parliament that would become entrenched and a few interesting decisions in the first term would make the public really receptive to keeping that going. Well, th thanks very much. <clears throat> now, uh, I, I feel very guilty now because we're going to manage about maybe two questions, but Cameron and Jeff are both going to be around, so I hope people are going to swarm around them in the tea break and lunchtime and, and, and continue this discussion. So um, the, the best question gets a book yeah. today? <laughs> and you'll owe me one. That's how the game starts. <laughs> And the other book too. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll take one question from maybe the, um, the woman in the blue t-shirt. Sorry, and I'll, I'll choose one at the front. Perhaps you could negotiate. Oh, okay, Hi, um, Cameron, it's so rare for us to hear the blatant truth about how things operate that my burning question ever since I heard you on ABC RN was how are you safe? <laughs> um, How are you still walking around and, and then why aren't more people but yeah. Uh, I think I'm a small target. I'm, I'm an older millennial so I don't really have any money. <laughs> uh, so I pretty much, I've spent more than I earned for 10 years so I mean what are they going to do, sue me um, for defamation? <laughs> I can, they can have my bike. Like. <laughs> uh, so the, it's being a small target, um, being oh a quirky God. academic. Uh, yeah, the, the, a lot of uh, uh, politicians have now come to say, uh, oh, that's just an academic exercise. He's just a theoretical guy. He, you know, I'm like, uh, it's your data, it's your department's decisions in my... Um, so they've got their ways to sort of diminish what I say and sideline it. Um, and I happen to know a lot of them personally now, so maybe it's difficult to... I'm just the quirky, weird guy. <laughs> Okay, we've got two questions and the people have both got the microphone. I'm terribly sorry to disappoint other people because I know there are lots of questions, but please just come up to these guys and have a chat afterwards. Um, go ahead, over there, yeah. Thank you. Cameron and, and both speakers, thank you very much for um, a very interesting session. Um, you, I, I love the work on the political networks. I must say, though, that it has a real sense of familiarity we do know this, and I think a, quite a lot of this room has spent quite a lot of their energy working in networks to uh, use their, their collective capacity and power to change things. 
So we know how, we kind of know that networks are how you get things done. The problem is that our networks have so much less power than the networks of the mining industry and so on. And so your recommendation to us that we need to network with more powerful people, mm -hmm. it's interesting um, and certainly it's something that people do, but, but what you actually recommended at the end with the Queensland Senate is institutional change. And it seems to me that, that the problem with the increasing power of mining and other interests, like property interests, is the weakening of institutions that work against that. I'm thinking of monetary um, democracy theory from that guy in Sydney. Uh, so they're not, they're not really mutually exclusive. So to change institutions, you need a big push politically. Um, you need a huge amount of public support. You need politicians who uh, are pressured to make that decision and will either use up their capital with their own personal networks to um, you know, keep the electorate happy and maintain their um, political position. So they're not mutually exclusive. You know, it's, it's in an ideal world, let's just change this institution. But then there's also, God, there's a lot of work organising to get even that discussion into the mainstream press in a way. Um, so that they're, they're not, you know, one, one feeds into the other and I think as you organise you want to have your big ticket institutional items that you're all pushing towards but you still need to organise. Uh, one of the interesting things that I learned from a, a, an anthropologist who studies organised crime, the Yakuza and the Mafia, he said if you really want to um, get someone on your side you need mutual dirt, you need to go and commit some crimes together so that you can blackmail each other to sustaining the alliance. Uh, so if, if you know any personal people in power that you can you know, have a few drinks with and go and do something stupid. Um, you know, it's not called the game of mates because it doesn't have those uh, tales of intrigue as well. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, we'll have uh, one more question, but I was just reminded with that particular question about Stephanie's impression of Bernie yesterday. What did you say about there's no change unless it comes from the bottom up? And it might be a pathetic gesture on my part, but bringing you all together yeah. and I hope forming more networks because as Bernie often says, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't do the impression, <laughs> but basically there are a lot more of us than there are of them. And if we would only connect together, given that we live in a democracy, actually we could uh, we could bring about change despite them, particularly if we are aware of some of the myths mm -hmm. that so many people take for granted. But we have, we have one more question. This gentleman has been waiting patiently to, to, to give. John Upton Miller, Steady State ACT. My question is for Cameron. Um, I'm just wondering the extent, if you could comment about the extent to which people want to be associated with the wealthy in a tribal sense. Uh, and, and my first question is whether political donations are actually all that important in that process, whether politicians are sufficiently want to be identified with the wealthy that they would do what they do even without the donations. And my second part of that is relates to there are many reasons why uh, the May 18, uh, May 19 election went the way it did, but I do wonder whether that whole sense of aspiration amongst the large sector of the Australian community to be part of or associated with the wealthy was one of the reasons that they voted the way they did, even though they know that we're going towards climate change catastrophe. <laughs> so, yes, I think people on average recognise as a society is organised in a particular way and if we don't play with the rules that exist, we're stuffed. I think a lot of the reason people send their kids to private schools is the networking payoff, mm. right? Um, because wh what else are you going to do? You know, it's a risky world out there if you don't have these networks and you're, you're on the outside and all of your kids are on the outside. Um, so yeah, people do aspire to be into it and I, I feel like also one of the tricks with the political debate is, is um, you know, People don't really want to hand out. They want to, you know, they want their share, but they sort of, everyone wants it to be a fair system. And I think if you're aspirational and 
and you know the discussion is, oh, we're just going to tax you and give to you. It doesn't feel like um, it, it, it's coherent with your, you know, you get what you earn sort of belief that we still have. You know, a lot of people uh, are wedded to, uh, I've worked hard for my money. You know, it's this is a sort of thing that we need to navigate around as well. Um, if we're on the left and we're thinking about redistribution, we need to still think about the independence and autonomy um, of people we're trying to help who, who sort of want to do it themselves and whether we construct the structure so that they're more rewarded for doing things themselves. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's a bit of a barrier there um, because we do all aspire to be rewarded for what we do and become wealthy. So I think that's one of the barriers. I don't know if that's a good answer. If we're wrapping up... Well, I, I'll just let Jeff have uh, the, the last words. Um, Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks. I just want to say I don't have copies of Economy, Society, Nature, the book available here, but I did make up a little flyer which would tell you how to go and find it. Um, and I do have some copies of the Little Green book. I'm afraid of economics, but I want to save the world. Um, and we'll leave them, I don't know, there or somewhere. Up, up in the lobby. Or in. And when Steve said he wanted to talk. One of my things is there's not one or two things wrong with the economic system.